If you look at a list of the highest grossing media properties of all time, you'll see a lot of familiar names that were developed by big companies. But down here at number 20, you'll see a $15 billion property that was started by two guys in their 20s with a little indie comic. And I don't mean they drew this comic on behalf of some company. They literally sat down in their living room, drew it, lettered it, and with a $1,000 loan from one of their uncles, started their own business to print and sell it. So how did this tiny, violent, black and white comic end up becoming a property bigger than the Avengers? Well, as I spent the last few weeks researching that question, the story I found was a lot more interesting and ultimately, like so many stories of rapid success, sadder than I could have expected. So let's head back to 1981, before the toys, the movies, the TV shows, to a 19-year-old Kevin Eastman, a guy who desperately wants to be a comic artist but is currently stuck boiling lobsters at a restaurant in Maine. In his free time, Eastman devours all types of comics. He especially loves the king himself, Jack Kirby. But he reads everything from superhero comics to the edgy European import heavy metal, which we'll come back to later. Now, in his quest to to find all the most interesting comics, he comes across a local self-published comic magazine called Scat. He likes what he sees, so he writes a letter to the guys making it and ends up getting connected with one of Scat's main artists, Peter Laird. Laird invites Eastman over, and what does Eastman see up on Laird's wall? a piece of original Jack Kirby art. Now, Laird is eight years older than Eastman, but despite the difference in age, the two become fast friends, bonding over their love of comics and bad TV, and because Laird too dreams of becoming a comic book artist. Pretty soon, Eastman moves in with Laird. Eastman keeps working at restaurants, and Laird is scraping by doing illustrations for local gardening magazines and newspapers, but they both want to land that big job at Marvel, DC, or another big comic publisher, so they spend their nights hanging out and drawing comics in front of the TV. Well, on one of those fateful comic drawing nights, Eastman whips up a sketch to try and make Laird laugh. It's a turtle with nunchucks strapped to his arms. Laird grabs a piece of paper and does his own rendition. Eastman gives the drawing a name, Ninja Turtle. Laird fires back, adding Teenage Mutant. And it's here, in this moment, at the very conception of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, that I think we find our first clue as to why they would become so wildly successful. The idea wasn't created by some toy executive or marketing guru. It wasn't even created by a work-for-hire comic artist trying to meet a deadline. It was made by two friends who were just trying to make each other laugh. Of course, at this point, they have no idea where this little sketch is gonna take them, but they must have known they had something special because they decide to turn that sketch into a full comic. They multiply their little turtle by four, give each of them a name based on Renaissance painters, and base their personalities on themselves and their friends. Donatello is Laird, the reserved tech geek, and Eastman is Raphael, the wild hothead. And this, for me, is where we see the second key to TMNT's success. It's such an odd choice to use your main character design four times, but at its core, this is a story about friendship, the friendship between Eastman and Laird, and its mirror in the turtles themselves. To fill out the rest of the turtles' origin story, they fill the comic with things they love. One of the things they love is Daredevil. So the turtles' origin story actually happens just out of frame of Daredevil's origin story, where the goo that gave Matt Murdock his powers drips on a few turtles. And it doesn't stop there. Daredevil's master is Stick, so of course the turtles study under Splinter. Daredevil fights the hand, so turtle fights the foot. People have called it a parody, but I don't think that's really an accurate description. It's more just a goofy celebration of the things they love, including Jack Kirby, to whom the structure of the book owes a lot of credit. And another crazy thing about these two guys is how they work. Instead of having one write, the other draw, or one pencil and the other ink, they both sit down next to each other and pass every page back and forth, each doing a little bit of the penciling, ink, and shading so that you can't see who did what on any particular page. That's insane. It's not how comics are supposed to work, but for these two guys, oh man, does it work. Over the course of the 40 page issue, they invent so many things that just a few years later would be deeply embedded in pop culture. The Turtles, Splinter, the Ooze, Sewers, the Shredder, the Foot Clan. It's got the raw exuberance of two guys who are just trying to amuse themselves and each other. And with a loan from Eastman's uncle, they print 3,000 copies of their comic. They name their publishing company Mirage Studios because it's not really a studio at all, just two guys in their living room. They fully expect they'll have copies copies of this comic sitting on their shelves for years to come. Eastman goes back to his summer job in Portland cooking lobsters, and Laird's wife gets a job in Connecticut, so he moves away. The roommates split up and go their separate ways. Only fate had other plans. All 3,000 issues of TMNT number one sell out. So they do a second print run of 6,000 more, and then all of those sell out. They've made enough money to pay Eastman's uncle back and even have a bit left over. So Eastman begins busing back and forth from Portland to Connecticut to work on issue two. It takes them a few months, but they finish issue two and sell 15,000 copies in the first print run. Then they reprint issue one and sell 30,000 more copies. Something's happening. They quit their jobs. Eastman moves to Connecticut to work on issue three, which launches with a print run of 50,000 copies. Three issues 
years in and they've achieved their dream. They are making a living, at least a small living, but a living by drawing comics. But for better or worse, they have no idea what comes next. But before we move on, let's take a look at these comics because there's so much talk about how successful in business Eastman and Laird became that there can be this false narrative that these guys were just really lucky or at best were really good character designers. What I think people forget is how freaking good these comics are. The energy in these early issues is off the charts. There's no editor, no boss telling them what they could or couldn't do, so they just decide to do whatever they want. Like in issue three, they set out to do the longest car chase in comic history, and they do. And it works because the staging, the geography, the pacing of it, all of it's absolutely masterful. There may be a roughness to some of their drawings, but it doesn't stop them from trying to push the comic medium forward. I don't know how much manga they had access to at this point, but there's a fluidity to the storytelling that really sets it apart from everything else coming out in the 80s in the West. Not only is the storytelling great, but they are channeling their hero Jack Kirby with the pace of invention. Issue 2 introduces April O'Neil, Baxter Stockman, the Mousers. Issue 3 has the TCRI aliens, and in the fourth issue they create Casey Jones. By issue 5, the turtles are in space, meaning aliens and robots. There's this pure raw joy of being able to make a living drawing comics with your buddy that just spills out onto every page. And that fun is infectious, because soon, the suits start calling. Eastman and Laird get approached by a bunch of licensing agents who promise big TV shows and toy deals, but they want exclusivity and these long five-year contracts. But Eastman and Laird are savvy. They know better than to give away control of their creation. And as we'll soon see, that will be both a good thing and a bad thing for them. But when licensing agent Mark Friedman shows up and offers them a 30-day, non-exclusive deal to prove what he can do, they decide to let him take a shot. And I want to recognize how the Turtles franchise seems to always attract underdogs. Mark Friedman was not a big hotshot licensing agent. He had to rent a suit and a tie for his meeting with Eastman and Laird. And in the 30 days he was given, he gets a deal with Playmates. Playmates was a doll manufacturer, but wanted to challenge Hasbro and Mattel in the action figure space. So they were an underdog in their own way too. Well, with the toy deal in place, they hire an agency to produce a five episode TV cartoon. And unlike if they had worked for DC or Marvel, Eastman and Laird are in control of everything. And you have to give them credit because because they're very receptive collaborators with the toy and animation companies. They let them sand the rough edges off their creation, adding colored bandanas and pizza, removing the violence, the grittiness, and the kind of phallic looking tails. Now Laird had an especially hard time with this, but he went along with what these older, wiser executives were telling him. And at the end of the day, Eastman and Laird agreed that whatever happened with the toys and cartoons, they'd always have their black and white comic where they could tell their version of the turtles. Sadly, those would turn out to be the famous last words, but we'll get to that. First, Turtle Mania. If it looks truly to you, you don't know how to recognize a $350 million a year industry when you see it. In case you weren't alive in the late 80s, the show and figures turned out to be a huge success. They captured the imagination of kids across the country. Despite all the changes, they'd successfully translated the fun and energy of the comic into cartoon and plastic form, and kids were absolutely losing their minds for it. The show quickly became the number one kids show, airing almost every day of the week, and the toys were selling out across the country. I think we have to remember the landscape at the time. Turtles are situated between the cornball 80s-ness of He-Man and Thundercats, but before the badassness of 90s anime animation and the anime invasion. It's easy to forget how unique something like the Turtles would have been when it came out because so much of what came after it was trying to replicate it. The money was flowing in, Mirage was growing, Kevin Eastman bought a tank, and the licensing deals kept coming. But before we move on, I want to look at one of the comics they published during this period because I think it gives us a pretty good insight into where their heads were at. In it, the Turtles downstairs neighbor is none other than Jack Kirby. But this Jack Kirby has a magical gem which, when attached to his drawing pencil, brings anything that he draws into the real world. And that must have been exactly how Eastman and Laird felt at that moment, watching the little drawings from their living room come to life and take over every corner of pop culture. But that comic doesn't exactly have a happy ending. You see Kirby, along with Donatello, go through a portal to a world populated entirely by his drawings. But the drawings attack them, and Kirby has to overcome his artist block to fight back. And while he succeeds and Donatello escapes, Kirby is trapped forever in the world of his drawings. Before the portal closes, he sends Donatello a note. On it is a drawing of a turtle, and a quote from one of Jack Kirby's comics. Life, at best, is bittersweet. You see, despite all the success, their relationship was falling apart. They were spending so much time managing the business that they barely had any time to work on the comic book. And when they did, they'd spent so much time apart that they were creatively on totally different pages. 
And by issue 10, their relationship had gotten so distant and fractured that they're going back and forth, whiting out each other's drawings and drawing over them. And it took them four months to get that issue of the comic out. Sadly, by this point, they'd gotten so sick of working together that they couldn't get through a single issue without a lot of unpleasantness and disagreements. And as you read these issues, you can almost feel them trying to heal their broken relationship. They moved the Turtles out of New York City to Northampton, Massachusetts, where they lived. The Turtles are broken and defeated, not on speaking terms with one another, each trying to cope with their failure in their own way. You can feel the melancholy, and you have to wonder which of them wrote this journal entry for April. I also have friends, real friends that I care for and that care for me. I'll always be there for them and they for me. This will probably be my last entry. I guess I just wanted some kind of final word, sort of wrap up all that I had written so far. Life is good and life goes on. It would be the last issue they worked on together as true collaborators. Their entire creative partnership had lasted for only 15 issues. They would remain business partners, but they decide to alternate issues of the comics so they wouldn't have to work together. And the quality of the comic does suffer pretty dramatically as they start trading off. They're not bad comics per se, but there's something that feels forced and just off about the whole thing. They do come together for a three issue run that brings the Turtles back to New York, not jamming like they used to, but at least they were both involved. And some of the spark comes back to the comic. But after that, they both step away from the comic completely, allowing the other members of the Mirage studio to run the comic while they focus on the business. But just as their relationship is breaking down, business is picking up. A movie is in production, a show is on the air, toys and video games are launching all the time. They're stuck in it together, but they want different things. Larry wants to slow it down a bit and enjoy all the success they've had, but Eastman can't sit still. Beyond managing Mirage and the Turtles empire, he founds a museum for comic art. He starts a second publishing company called Tundra to focus on more mature storytelling that didn't fit in at Mirage. And remember Heavy Metal Magazine, which was a big influence on him? Well, he buys it and starts running that too. Mirage publishes a ton of comics in this period, but neither Eastman or Laird have significant involvement. They had aimed to become professional comic artists, and the rocket ship of success had blasted them right past their dream. For issue 50, they come together once more. They plan out a 12 issue arc, but they only make it one issue working together as collaborators before Eastman leaves again and Laird finishes the series with other artists. After that run, Laird leaves too. They cancel the original Turtles comic after only 62 issues and relaunch a color version written and drawn by Jim Lawson, but even that version only lasts 13 issues. Turtle Mania is dying down. The third movie is a critical failure and plans for a fourth movie are scrapped. The hit cartoon show is canceled and Playmates winds down its toys. They even turn the rights of the comics over to Image, who does a very 90s grim and gritty take on the Turtles with no involvement from the Mirage crew. They make a final attempt to save the franchise with a live action TV reboot called The Next Mutation. But during development, Eastman and Laird have a huge falling out over the inclusion of a fifth turtle, Venus de Milo. The show comes out with a fifth turtle, but it was the final straw in their friendship and their partnership, and the show is a commercial failure anyway. Turtle mania was over. Eastman wants to move on with his life, and he sells his share of the turtles to Peter Laird and walks away from his creation. It seems he burned a lot of bridges, because in an interview a few years later, he says he doesn't even talk to anyone from that time in his life. And if this story ended there, this wouldn't be a $15 billion property. It would be a little comic and a crazy toy fad that impacted one generation of kids. But the story doesn't end there, because after a few years of no Turtles media at all, something interesting happens. A new TMNT comic book comes out written by Peter Laird. It's black and white and published by Mirage. Laird ignores the image run and picks up the story from the last Mirage comics as if all those years had never happened. It's very much the Laird version of the Turtles, which can be a bit jarring if you only know the original show. It's very sci-fi and at times very serious and soapy. It feels like an honest to God indie comic again, quirky and personal, and you can tell Laird is having fun. And from there, things pick up steam. Laird, now the sole owner of Turtles, gets a new show on the air. And this time he gets to do it his way. That means no bebop and rock steady, no goofy gags, no mutant of the week, and a lot more violence and action and long epic story arcs. And people like it. Playmates decides to start making toys again. Laird works with a movie studio to get another film out in 2007, 14 years after the last time Turtles were in theaters. And I feel like it's this era that really saved the Turtles. Because Laird came back and once again with a tiny black and white indie comic proved that the Turtles mattered. They weren't going to be some 80s novelty. They were going to impact generation after generation. It's a great era of Turtles media. The only thing missing is Kevin Eastman, but we'll get back to him. Laird claims he'll do the book as long as he's having fun, and I guess after a few years he stops having fun because the book slows down after about 30 issues. Around this time, the animated show had run its course, and Laird decides the time has finally come. He sells the rights to the Turtles to Viacom. 25 years after their creation, for the first time in history, neither Eastman or Laird are in control of the Turtles' fate. But that's not the end of the story either. Viacom does a deal with IDW to publish new Turtles comics in a new continuity. And who do they hire to write it? Tom Waltz. But who do they hire to co-write it and do the layouts? 
Kevin Eastman. That's right, he's back. Apparently he just needed a good 14 year break to re-energize. So now, after so many years of the Laird version of the Turtles, we get the Eastman version. And guess what? It's also really good. I'm gonna put a reading guide down below because it really is shocking how many really good Turtles comics there are and it can be overwhelming. Eastman even gets involved in consulting with a new TV show and the new movies. Obviously in this era, the Turtles are more ninja-y, less sci-fi, and man, you gotta love all these Eastman layouts. Yet another generation gets to grow up with the Turtles in their lives, still piloted by one of their co-creators. Sadly, we're still missing Peter Laird. Honestly, he seems to be happy running his blog and making ambivalent comments about the new Turtles stuff, getting really into pottery, but it feels like this story is missing an ending. I have this parasocial need for these guys to be friends with each other again. They gave me so much in my childhood, and I feel I owe them that. Well, apparently, so did somebody at Netflix. For the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle episode of the show Toys That Made Us, they decide to bring Eastman and Laird together again for the first time. Now, that's just marketing BS because they had been together a few times at conventions, but man, I can't watch this without tearing up. We had that window installed. Yeah. I guess our big idea was we each have a drawing table next to the window. I'd be in the other room, you'd be here. Yep. And we'd literally pass pages through the window. It never happened. No. That moment, that pause when they both look at what could have been. The life unlived, where they had a lot less money, a lot less fame, but got to spend their lives drawing comics with their friend, passing the pages back and forth. But that's not the end of this story either, because shortly after that meeting, a new Turtles book comes out. And look who it's credited to, Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird. It seems that sometime after that meeting, Eastman dug through some old boxes and found an outline for a Turtles graphic novel that he and Laird had drafted during the golden years of their collaboration in the late 80s, but never got to make into a reality because their success distracted them. With Laird's blessing, Eastman expands the outline into a five-issue series, and it's probably the closest thing we'll get to a new Eastman and Laird collaboration. Interestingly, it ignores all the continuity from the image run, Laird's run, Eastman's run, erasing all those years of strife and discord, and serves as a direct continuation of and conclusion to their original collaboration. And of course, the magic was back, and it was a huge success. And the plot of that comic? It follows the last surviving turtle in his final struggle against the Foot Clan, lonely and haunted by guilt and remorse and the memory of his lost friends. As he lays their weapons down to rest one final time, he says, I miss my brothers so much. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and if you did, please hit the like and subscribe buttons and leave a comment down below. Thanks so much, and I'll see you soon.